Thank you for joining us for our presentation entitled Cancer Immunotherapy, Experimental Models and Approaches. By the end of today's presentation, I hope that you'll be able to explain current approaches for cancer immunotherapy, distinguish between and choose appropriate mouse models, including classic and cutting-edge models, as well as successfully find JAKS models for immuno-oncology research. Let's start with explaining the current approaches for cancer immunotherapy. As we are all probably aware of, cancer is the process by which a cell loses its ability to regulate its growth and begins to proliferate in an uncontrolled fashion, potentially invading other organs or spreading throughout the body. Immune cells have the ability to recognize and attack tumor cells through antigens or protein products that are expressed abnormally by tumors. Tumor cell antigens can be either from normal proteins that are expressed at supraphysiological concentrations and or conditions, or they can be aberrant proteins that are either misfolded, mutated, or gene fusion products that have gained a novel function. These antigens can be expressed only by tumors, so-called tumor-specific antigens, or they can be expressed by both normal cells and tumors called tumor-associated antigens. And although we typically think of antigens being displayed on the cell surface, they can also be expressed intracellularly as well as on the cell surface. Cancer cell antigens are primarily the primary gateway for immune cell recognition and serve as the foundation of cancer immunotherapy. And so today we'll be discussing uh, different mouse models that are used to develop these types of compounds. Before we get too far into our presentation, I'd like to quickly discuss the immune system so that we're all on the same page. The immune system can be broken up into two different components, innate immunity as well as adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is the first line of defense against pathogens and foreign invaders, and it contains various components that are hardwired to recognize and respond to diverse pathogens. Innate immunity includes the complement system, which is involved in lysing pathogenic bacteria and cells bound by antibodies, macrophages, which also engulf dead and dying cells, granulocytes that participate in allergic and inflammatory responses, and finally natural killer cells which have the direct ability to kill infected or cancer cells. The adaptive branch of immunity includes B cells which produce antibodies as well as T cells which are comprised of CD4 positive T helper cells which help B cells make antibodies or T cytotoxic T cells which are CD8 positive that have the ability to directly kill infected cells or cancer cells. Finally, dendritic cells serve as a uh, bridge between innate immunity and adaptive immunity and are the primary antigen presenting cells of the immune system that can present tumor antigens to other immune cells. Cytokines as well as uh, dendritic cells uh, provide a bridge between innate and adaptive immunity as they are responded to and released by all cell types of the immune system. So as I mentioned, there are multiple cell types of the immune system that participate in what we call anti-tumor immunity, including natural killer cells and cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells, which both have the ability to directly kill tumor cells. There are also macrophages, which engulf tumors. Dendritic cells, which as I mentioned, are the main presenting cells of the uh, immune system, and they can present those tumor-associated or tumor-specific uh, antigens to other immune cell types. And then finally, there are T helper cells, which help B cells make more antibodies against those tumor cell antigens. Now, under normal circumstances, T cells will recognize foreign antigens or cancer antigens via MHC presentation by a cancer cell. In this case, we have a CD8 positive T cell that recognizes a cancer cell antigen via uh, MHC class 1. This, in turn, activates the T cell to release cytotoxic granules, and that includes perforin, granzyme, or, and granulysin that can kill that cancer cell. Once T cells become activated, they also increase expression of the checkpoint molecule PD-1, which upon binding shuts off T cell responses. However, at physiological conditions, PD-1 ligands are low in concentration and do not dampen T cell concentration. Conversely, during tumorigenesis, cancer cells 
uh, learn different ways to overcome and evade immune cell recognition. And one way they do this is by expressing the PD-1 ligand, PDL1. By doing this, they effectively shut off T cell activation, and those corresponding T cells become energic. There are other proteins that are dysregulated during tumor formation, including proteins involved in angiogenesis, as well as proliferation, DNA repair, and apoptosis, as well as cell adhesion. By targeting these antigens by either blocking corresponding receptors and downstream effectors, immuno-oncology compounds can be used to restore these imbalances that the immune system has this natural ability to detect and uh, attack these cancer cells. So that's exactly what cancer immunotherapy is. It's that strategy used to enhance the immune system's ability to recognize and fight tumor cells. And these can be either cell-mediated to include cytotoxic T cells, natricular cells, and dendritic cells, or they can be antibody-based. And that includes antibody drug conjugates, or ADCs, antibody-dependent cytotoxicity, or complement-dependent cytotoxicity. And we'll talk about more of those here in uh, just a moment. Finally, there are cytokine therapies uh, that are used less frequently, but uh, still nonetheless they've been used um, to enhance the natural immune system's ability to recognize and fight tumors. Antibody therapeutics are arguably the most popular uh, strategies used in, in the field of immuno-oncology, and they exert their mechanism of actions in several different ways. The first of which we'll discuss is through phagocytosis, or antibody-dependent phagocytosis, uh, also known as ADPH. And essentially what happens is a macrophage will bind to the FC portion of the antibody, and that will mediate phagocytosis of that tumor cell. There's also complement-dependent cyt cytotoxicity, or CDC, in which the complement will bind to the FC portion of that antibody and create what's called a membrane attack complex to induce apoptosis of that cell. There's also ADCC, or antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, in which a natural killer cell will bind to the FC portion of that antibody that will then subsequently release granzyme and perforin to then cause apoptosis of that tumor cell. And then finally, there's cross-presentation and T-cell activation in which a dendritic cell will present that cancer cell antigen to a neighboring T-cell, which will then mediate the appropriate response. There are also additional mechanisms of action, including a more targeted chemotherapy delivery, including antibody drug conjugates, in which a chemotherapeutic drug is conjugated to that therapeutic antibody so that there are less off-target effects. There's also neutralization either of a receptor or of a ligand and through mechanisms that are not quite known or fully understood are uh, the induction of apoptosis directly by that antibody. Consequently we can see that many antibody-based therapies have made it to the clinic and are widely used alone or in combination uh, to treat different cancers including Keytruda, Avastin, Herceptin, and these are just some of them that have made it to the clinic. Um, but what's important to know is that they all had to be tested in a preclinical model first. So now let's talk about some of those models, uh, some of the classic models used for cancer immunotherapy. So as we start to talk about the different mouse models used for preclinical validation of immuno-oncology compounds, we'll start to see that there's a whole spectrum of immune cell function present in mice, with some having most, if not all, of their immune cells and function present, and those are called immunocompetent models, and then there are some that have a degree of immunodeficiency or lack of immune cell populations or function, those are called immunodeficients. And so we can see that uh, a number of very popular immunocompetent and immunodeficient strains uh, have been used for this purpose, and so we'll see um, a number of these examples today. First, let's talk about immunocompetent models. Some of the benefits to using immunocompetent models is that they are, in general, less expensive than their immunodeficient counterparts. They also have their uh, immune cell systems and function intact, uh, largely. Finally, they also can be used as syngenetic tumor hosts, in which a tumor that's derived from the same genetic background can be implanted into a recipient mouse, and these are called syngenetic tumors. And then finally, they are used uh, for uh, proof-of-concept studies for preclinical studies. 
Some of the limitations for using immunocompetent models are that they only permit the engraftment of mouse tumor cell lines, and they cannot engraft human tumors. Also, some models will spontaneously develop mouse tumors. Also, mechanisms that are seen and observed in immunocompetent models are not always translatable to humans. And finally, because the compounds have to be developed to specifically target mouse proteins, those compounds are mouse specific and you have to develop human specific targets once you demonstrate efficacy. So essentially, uh, you'll be doubling your work. So I just would like to again remind you that immunocompetent models have their immune systems largely intact. For our first example, we're going to look at a BALB-C mouse, uh, which is a very popular inbred strain um, in which BALB-C derived cancer cell lines that are EGFR and HER2 positive were injected into a BALB-C recipient mouse. So this is uh, one example of syngeneic tumor modeling. EGFR, or epidermal growth factor receptor, is commonly upregulated in a number of cancers and is correlated with poor patient prognosis. And so effectively, th these uh, investigators wanted to test the efficacy of their therapeutic monoclonal antibody against EGFR and measure tumor volume as a response. And so what we can see here is that when they measure tumor growth over the course of almost 40 days, you can see that their therapeutic antibody inhibited tumor growth as compared to their human IgG control. They also wanted to test which immune cell populations are contributing to this phenotype, so they administered a depleting CD8 antibody, which effectively inhibits CD8 positive T cell function. What we can see is that in combination with their therapeutic antibody and their uh, depleting CD8 positive monoclonal antibody that they were able to rescue tumor growth. And so this demonstrates that CD8 positive T cells that are functional in the BALB-C mice are playing a role in this anti-tumor immunity. Also, CD8 positive T cells release interferon gamma, which is an anti-tumor uh, cytokine, and so they measured interferon gamma production in response to their therapeutic antibody, and we can see that in response to this antibody, they see uh, much higher levels of interferon gamma production. And then finally, they wanted to know whether or not dendritic cells are playing a role in the anti-tumor immunity. So what they did is they um, conjugated CPG motif, which is a TLR9 ligand, and it stimulates dendritic cell responses. And so when they administered their therapeutic antibody conjugated to their CPG, they see higher levels of IL-2 production from dendritic cells, indicating that dendritic cells are also playing a role in this anti-tumor immunity. Together, this data demonstrates that immune cell populations in BALB-C mice are functional and can be used to assess the efficacy and mechanism of therapeutic antibodies. For our next example, we're going to take a look at C57 black 6 mouse, a syngeneic tumor modeling in which B16 F10 tumor cells that are derived from the C57 black 6 mouse was injected into a recipient C57 black 6 mouse in order to test the efficacy of their therapeutic antibody TA99, which recognizes an epitope of the B16 F10 uh, tumor cell line. The investigators wanted to measure antibody dependent phagocytosis, or ADPH, which we've talked about earlier. And so what we can see here is in the macrophages that are green and the cancer cells that are red, uh, we can see that the macrophages over time do engulf those those cancer cells, and we can see this represented graphically in response to their therapeutic antibody, TA99, that phagocytosis percentages uh, go up dramatically. So this indicates that macrophages within the C57 black 6 mouse are capable of mounting the appropriate response in the presence of a therapeutic antibody. So we've seen two examples where immune cell uh, populations within immunocompetent mouse models are able to mount the appropriate response in the presence of therapeutic antibodies. However, these are mouse immune cells, uh, mouse immune cell populations and functions, and these may not fully correlate to human immune cell populations. And so that's where immunodeficient mouse models come in um, and help to address that problem. 
So immunodeficient mouse models support the engraftment of human tumors in cell lines. Um, they also are capable of orthotopic cancer modeling, as well as adoptive transfer of functional immune cell populations from humans. Some of the limitations are that they do not have endogenous cell functions, and because of that reason, they are more susceptible to pathogenic infection. The first immunodeficient mouse model we're going to talk about are NOD skids. Now, NOD skids, or NOD, stand for non obese diabetic severe combined immunodeficiency mice, in which the NOD background contributes to a range of innate immune cell deficiencies, including no complement, reduced macrophages, natural killers cells, and dendritic cells. And finally, the skid mutation results in a lack of B cells and T cells. So what you're left with is a severely immunocompromised mouse. So for these particular experiments, the investigators injected intravenously uh, primary leukemic cells that were uh, CD19 and CD38 positive that were isolated directly from patient peripheral blood. CD38 is required for the homing and proliferation of this particular leukemia. And so the, in these experiments, the investigators took their therapeutic antibody, which they call SUN4B7, which blocks CD38, and their negative control, which is a non blocking anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, which they call OKT10. And they measure homing and proliferation both in the spleen and the bone marrow. And what we can see is that in both organs, blocking CD38 antibody was able to inhibit proliferation and homing both of these organs. What I'm also not showing you is that they uh, demonstrated that their therapeutic antibody was able to downregulate ERK1 and 2 phosphorylation, which has been shown to be involved in proliferation. So the next immunodeficient mouse model I'd like to talk about are NODSKID gammas, or NSG mice. So NODSKID gammas are essentially NODSKIDs, but they also have the gamma mutation and the IL-2 receptor gamma chain knockout, which results in a lack of natural killer cell function which has been shown to be a major impediment of human immune cell engraftment. So for this particular example, the investigators wanted to test their therapeutic antibody against WT1 or Wilms tumor 1, which is an intracellular oncoprotein that's upregulated in a number of leukemias and solid cancers. And so uh, with WT1 being intracellular, it's typically uh, difficult to target this protein because Many monoclonal um, antibodies will only target extracellular proteins. So they wanted to test the efficacy of their therapeutic antibody that was TCR-like against WT1 antibody, in which it recognizes the WT1 epitope in the context of HLA-A2. So the investigators took primary WT1-positive AML cells from HLA-A2 positive and uh, negative patients and then tested the efficacy of their therapeutic antibody. And as we can see here in the uh, presence of their therapeutic antibody, as they measured cell lysis of their AML blasts, we can see a high level of lysis only in the presence of their therapeutic antibody in the context of HLA-A2, and we didn't see that in HLA-A2 negative blasts. So this demonstrates that their therapeutic antibody is specific for WT1 only in the context of um, HLA-A2. They also wanted to test the effects on tumor growth, and so what they did was to take BV173 cells, which are human pre-B cell leukemia that's also WT1 positive, and they injected these cells intravenously into NSG mice, plus or minus their antibody, in addition to peripheral blood mononuclear cells from healthy donors. And they measured luminescence as a readout for tumor growth, and what we can see is that in the presence of their therapeutic antibody and their uh, effectors, which are the healthy PBMCs, that we see a reduction, they saw a reduction in tumor growth. And this also correlated with survival only in the presence of their therapeutic antibody. And so this demonstrates that NSG mice not only engraft cancer cell populations, but they also support human immune cell populations and that these cells retain their function and their ability to fight tumors. 
And so that's what, what brings me to the so-called humanized mice, which are injected with human CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. And so the benefits to using these models are that they support the engraftment of uh, multi-lineage uh, differentiation of immune cell populations from hematopoietic stem cells. They uh, allow for the establishment of human immune cell function within a mouse. And finally, you can co-engraft human cancer cell lines and patient-derived xenografts. And um, these are emerging models that we will be talking about in the next few slides. Some limitations are that not all human immune cell populations are represented. And finally, not all immune cell function is retained in these models as compared to uh, what's seen in human patients. Here at JAX have humanized NSG mice in which we routinely engraft human hematopoietic stem cells uh, that are CD34 positive uh, via tail vein into NSG mice that are pre-validated to ensure that they have at least 25% human immune cell populations within the peripheral blood. So how that works is we take a three-week-old female NSG mice, uh, sublethally irradiate them, and then via tail vein inject human hematopoietic stem cells. And then at about 12 weeks later, we'll start to see human B cells appear, and then 15 weeks later, human T cells will start to appear. And so I'm not going to show you all of the data, but these humanized mice develop uh, multi-lineage engraftment of other immune cell populations. So I'd like to show you in the bone marrow, when we look at human CD45 versus mouse CD45, and human CD45 is on the y-axis, x-axis is mouse CD45, and what we can see is a high level of human immune cell engraftment in the bone marrow. It's nearly 90%. We also see IgM producing B cells as well as a number of antigen presenting cell populations. And when we look in the peripheral blood, again at human CD45 versus mouse CD45, we do again see high levels of human immune cell engraftment. And of those human immune cell populations, uh, we do see natural killer cells as well as monocytes. And finally, mature T cells and CD20 positive B cells. Immune cell function has been tested in these models, and functional innate immunity has been demonstrated, including myeloid phagocytosis, as well as natural killer cell activity, as well as adaptive immunity, including cytotoxicity from T cells, so CD8 positive T cells, as well as delayed type hypersensitivity. Finally, um, B cell immunoglobulins. I will say that antibody production has been a limitation of these models in that not much IgG production has been demonstrated, but that is um, an ongoing research effort. So I'd like to show you uh, some internal data from our own in vivo pharmacology services in which we test uh, the DTH or delayed type hypersensitivity response, which is a CD4 positive T cell response, in which we measure ear thickness as a readout for DTH after sensitizing NSG, humanized NSG mice with dinitrofluorobenzene. And so over the course of a week, we uh, measure ear thickness and we can see that NSG mice that were sensitized with DNFB demonstrate this DTH response as compared to NSG mice that were humanized NSG mice that were sensitized with only olive oil or with DFNB and hydrocortisone, which uh, reduces inflammatory responses. So this demonstrates that humanized NSG mice do indeed have intact CD4 positive DTH responses. So now I'd like to switch gears and tell you some information about some more cutting-edge models that are NSG-based. So as we've uh, talked about and as I've shown you a little bit of examples about, NSG mice can be engrafted with human immune cell populations um, as well as human tumors uh, and human tumor cell lines. Well, uh, NSG mice actually serve, serve as the platform for our patient-derived xenograft program and we, we take fragments of tumors and in inject them into recipient NSG mice, and these are called P0 mice. We then allow those tumors to grow, and then once they've grown to sufficient size, we remove them, uh, excise them, and fragment them again. Some of those fragments are then subjected to gene expression and copy number analysis, and some of them are cryopreserved in our cryobank. 
and then a number of those tumors are then implanted into P1 recipient um, NSG mice. And those tumors are allowed to grow to then create our archived PDX tumor bank. And so information that's taken uh, typically at the P0 and P1 stage are the tumor type as well as the grade and any markers if we know, as well as the treatment history including treatments that were successful and which ones were not successful. Finally, histopathology is performed by a hospital clinician who is trained to look at human samples as well as gene expression array and copy number var variation array analysis. So to generate uh, cohorts of mice that are ready to be placed on study, we take those archived PDX tumors and implant them into donor mice, which are P2 mice. We allow those tumor fragments to grow, and then we'll take those P2 fragments and implant them into NSG mice that are then P3 tumor-bearing mice that can then be placed on study. And so over the years, we have developed a number of collaborations with cancer centers nationwide to develop an extensive tumor bank. And uh, this allows for us not only to continually receive tumors that are being seen in the clinic currently, but also to represent different patient demographics that are seen throughout the nation. Consequently, as, an, as a result of our collaborations, we have over 350 uh, different PDX models available, with the majority of them being in lung cancer, brain cancer, as well as colorectal cancer. What happens if you marry the two together where you take a PDX model, uh, you engraft a patient tumor, but you also engraft human immune cells into the same mouse. Well, that is the next step in cancer modeling, and we are calling those our humanized tumor-bearing NSG mice. As a proof of concept, actually, um, investigators published a paper uh, just last year in monoclonal antibodies in which they took human CD34 hematopoietic stem cells and co-transplanted them with human breast cancer cell lines into NSG mice. They measured tumor growth and metastasis, and they also measured human immune cell engraftment and function. And the whole goal of these studies uh, was to validate a preclinical model that supports both human tumors and immune cells for the development of novel cancer immunotherapies. So I'm not going to be able to show you all the data, but uh, the investigators did take those tumor cells and um, demonstrate that they grow into palpable tumors, as we can see on the left panel, and that also retained their HER2 positivity. They also looked at human immune cell populations in the spleen, bone marrow, and lymph node, and again we can see, or the investigators saw, substantial human CD45 positive immune cells in all of these organs. They also looked at B cells, T cells, and myeloid populations in all of these organs and were able to demonstrate these different subpopulations. They also measured antibody production. They looked at IgM, IgG, as well as tumor-specific antibodies, and they were able to observe these different populations. While this publication came out, we were actually in the midst of performing our own experiments and validating this model in which we take an NSG mouse, inject it uh, via tail vein with human hematopoietic stem cells. These human hematopoietic stem cells will home to the bone marrow and engraft and repopulate into all major immune cell types of the blood. And I should say differentiate into all immune cell types of the blood. You can then engraft a tumor. That tumor will grow. And then this serves as the uh, perfect platform for testing a different uh, an anti-cancer drug. So in this particular example, it's a monoclonal antibody that targets that uh, tumor. That mobilizes that human immune system to then go and mediate uh, anti-tumor immunity. And so I'm going to show you some new experiments in which we have validated uh, this, this exciting new model. So some of the questions that we had to answer this new model or whether or not the timing of the implantation of the PDX model or the cell lines is important. Also, we wanted to know whether or not HLA matching between the humanized mouse and the patient PDX tumor is important. 
and we also wanted to uh, determine whether or not these models would respond to standard of care therapy and would it be different in humanized versus non-humanized NSG mice. And then finally we wanted to test immunomodulation via PD-1 and CTLA-4 and in an effort to determine whether or not these immuno-oncology models would proved to be successful in deterring tumor growth in humanized tumor-bearing NSG mice. So for our first experiments, we wanted to test whether or not the timing of engraftment was important. So we took humanized NSG mice and then injected them with SKOV ovarian cancer cells either two weeks post human immune cell engraftment or 12 weeks post-human immune cell engraftment, and these are non-HLA matched tissues. And what we can see is that in both instances, the tumors were uh, able to engraft as, and grow. Um, we see that at the two weeks post-human immune cell engraftment, um, timing seems to be a little bit higher, but we have to uh, repeat these experiments to see if that will repeat. But in general, this demonstrates that these cancer cell lines uh, can engraft even in the presence of a human immune system that's not HLA matched. On the flip side, we also looked at human immune cell engraftment by measuring human CD45 at 50 weeks post inoculation. And what we can see is that um, in both instances, human immune cell populations are present. Again, this is very interesting to us because these are not HLA matched tissues. And so we see this um, in the presence of uh, even tumor cells. So tumor cells don't inhibit human immune cell engraftment. The next question we wanted to ask was whether or not um, we see a difference in tumor engraftment in NSG mice that have an immune system or don't have immune system. And so what we did was we took an invasive ductal breast cancer and engrafted that into humanized NSG mice or plain NSG mice and then measured engraftment over the course of about 40 days. And what we can see is that the tumor grew readily um, even in the presence of humanized NSG mice, albeit lower. Um, and so again, this is really interesting because this is a non-HLA matched tissue. We also measured the engraftment of a lung carcinoma as well as soft tissue carcinoma in NSG mice and uh, humanized NSG mice. And in both of these instances, we saw no difference in tumor growth in the NSG mice versus humanized NSG mice. And again, all of these are non-HLA matched tissues. Um, what I do want to say is that human CD45 immune cells were at least 25% of the uh, peripheral blood in both models. The next question we wanted to ask was whether or not these models would respond to chemotherapy uh, treatment as well as Avastin, which is a monoclonal antibody to HER2. And so what we did was took colon adenocarcinoma PDXs and engrafted them into humanized NSG mice. and treated them with 5-FU or Avastin and vehicle control. And what we can see here is that uh, both 5-FU as well as Avastin treatment exhibited significant tumor growth delay as compared to the vehicle control, um, demonstrating that this humanized NSG mouse that bears a tumor was able to respond to standard uh, chemotherapy treatment. And we can see this graphically, represented graphically on the right. Again, this is non-HLA um, matched tissue and human CD45 populations in the peripheral blood were at least 20%. Finally, we wanted to test the efficacy of standard of care treatment cisplatin as well as Keytruda, which is an anti p one monoclonal antibody in an invasive ductal breast, uh, breast carcinoma that had a high degree of PDL1 surface expression. So what we can see is that both Keytruda and cisplatin were able to inhibit tumor growth um, even in a humanized mouse setting. So this demonstrates that immuno-oncology compounds as well as standard of care compounds are efficacious in this setting. 
So what I've shown you today is that NSG mice are the state-of-the-art platform that can be used for your human cancer studies um, because they support the engraftment of human immune cells and tumor cells. They also support the co-engraftment of human peripheral blood mononuclear cells and tumor cells. Also there are widespread um, applications that can be and have been used for the NSG platform. And then finally, they should be your mouse of choice for cancer studies. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Jim Keck as well as Ming Shan Chen who um, really piloted these studies uh, here in our in vivo pharmacology services in Sacramento, California. And finally, I'd like to show you where you can go to find Jack's models for your immuno-oncology research. So we have a number of NHG-based uh, models for cancer and efficacy studies, including HLA class 1 transgenics as well as HLA class 2 transgenics, which allow for um, better T-cell responses. So we have a number of these listed here. You can click on any of these links, and you can see in the blue, these are the stock numbers um, associated with each strain. But you can also see all of our NSG-derived strains um, by visiting our NSG mouse model portfolio. So we also have a number of PDX offerings, including efficacy testing, in which you send us your experimental compound, and we will test the efficacy of your compound in tumor-bearing mice, and you can tell us which deliverables you would like uh, delivered to your facility for um, further testing. Um, we also offer cohorts of tumor-bearing mice in which you perform the efficacy testing of your compound at your own facility. We also have a number of supporting materials including snap frozen tumors and tissue sections and slides that can be used for uh, validation purposes. And finally for our nonprofit uh, customers we have tumor bearing mice in which you can passage that tumor into a recipient NSG mouse. So as I mentioned, if you're interested in using these humanized NSG mice, you can order them from us where you can rely on our expertise as well as save yourself some time because we routinely engraft the CD34 model about every six weeks or so. And um, after 12 weeks, we validate these mice to ensure that they have at least 25% human immune cell engraftment. But typically, we see between 60 to 80% human immune cell engraftment in the peripheral blood. PVMC models available. If you'd like to make your own humanized models, uh, there are several published protocols that, that can help get you started, and some of these are listed here. So with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at micetech at jacks.org.